This is where we've been. This is the route from landing up at the top of the star through our first stop at Yellowknife Bay, and Ashwin will talk about the rest. But there were some obstacles that we had to overcome. You notice the Bagnell Dunes, which are the dark area with very dangerous sand for a rover, and the fact that we found out we had a lot of damage being done to our wheels as we moved across the terrain. We figured out how to deal with that. Couldn't get rid of it, but we figured out how to deal with it and keep the mission going. And we continued, and we continued, and we continued. And in fact, we're the fastest thing on Mars. We were able to <laughs> drive 17 kilometers in only 1,793 days, which is a record for any vehicle on Mars. <laughs> it's kind of a small club, though, so yeah, you have to understand. And we weren't just driving. Uh, this is our vehicle, and it has instruments galore. Ashwin will give you an idea of what they do. We can actually do a lot of fun things. We can drill, we can scoop, we can deliver that kind of material to a couple of analytical laboratories inside the body of the vehicle. We've got a laser that can actually vaporize rock and look at the, the spark that you see there and determine what's in the material. So it's a really cool device and it is extremely productive. And in fact, we are the most productive vehicle on Mars. <laughs> We've got over 19.6 terabytes that are delivered to the archive and available for the public and scientists to look at. And to put that in context, uh, I did a little Googling on the internet and said, I found out what the size of the iTunes music store was. And we are almost 20%, 19 point a bunch. So that gives you some idea of exactly how much data that we've actually delivered. Now, I'm not gonna belabor the point. Let's start looking at the data. And for that, Dr. Vasavada. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm uh, really excited to tell you all about the last five years. Uh, we have, of course, a uh, really productive rover, a really amazing robot, uh, the, probably the most sophisticated robot NASA has ever created. Uh, and we had the honor of seeing it launch off to Mars five years ago and actually planning it for about eight years before that, uh, and, um, and then arrive uh, five years ago and now celebrating this great milestone. Uh, so there's actually about, um, I don't know, six to ten hours of stuff I could tell you uh, in the concise form of everything the rover has done. So I'm really condensing it down to really what, what has been the main story of why Curiosity was sent to Mars by NASA and the scientific community, and then everything that we've discovered that um, has informed that story. Uh, so the story of Curiosity really is about uh, what we call habitability. Uh, whether Mars uh, ever offered the conditions that could support life. That's why Curiosity was sent to Mars. That's the place uh, and that's the sort of role it performs in the larger Mars, ex Mars exploration program, from figuring out if Mars ever had water, all the way to figuring out if Mars ever had living things today or in the past. We're in the middle there, figuring out, uh, now we, you know, Curiosity was launched knowing that there's water on Mars, uh, and we don't know there's life. So Curiosity uh, is, has been asking the question, did Mars ever offer a full range of habitable conditions? Not just the water, but the other things that life requires. And we have um, done a lot of work in that respect, and I am trying to make the case uh, to you tonight of everything we've accomplished and how much we've learned of just how habitable a planet Mars is. So it starts all the way back when, um, uh, the scientific story at least, starts all the way back when um, orbiters were orbiting Mars and mapping the planet in preparation for sending landed missions like Curiosity and discovered a crater, a uh, Gale crater, that had a weird mountain in the middle of it. And so this is just a nice illustration of Mars with um, an orbiter there, a Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, which is one of the current orbiters at Mars. Gale Crater has been actually mapped by three different missions and one of the things that really made Gale Crater stand out was this mountain in the middle of it. Uh, craters, for example, on the moon of this size, about 100 miles across, would not have a large mountain, a mound like that. They just have maybe a, a central peak, a very sharp mountain. 
Uh, and that uh, exposed a difference, of course, between the moon and Mars, that the moon has no atmosphere, but Mars having an atmosphere and even maybe water in the past can move stuff around, can erode rock from one place and move dirt around and collect it somewhere else. That was a huge discovery for the uh, promise of doing geology on Mars because layered rock uh, lends you a record, leaves a record behind that you can explore on the ground with a virtual geologist in the form of a rover. So here's Gale Crater, 100 miles across and about three miles deep. And there, there's the central peak that probably formed with the impact. But all this stuff, this is five mile, oh, sorry, five kilometers, three miles high of layered rock that we can see from orbit, discovered by uh, the Mars Global Surveyor, one of the uh, initial orbiters in the Mars Exploration Program, uh, to consist of layered rock that we think was brought in by water or wind in the past, and leaving this a very important record for us today. The other things that the later orbiters found, including the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which continues to be our communications link back to Earth every day, uh, that orbiter has a scientific instrument that also found that these layers change with height. As you go from the bottom of the mountain to the top, the minerals that are in the rock change, the chemistry, the texture, the look of the layers change, which also was just very exciting uh, news for the, uh, for the idea of being able to land a rover here on the plains where it's nice and safe and drive over and then slowly ascend through these layers and read Mars's history, you know, like a book, page by page, every layer being laid down on top of the next as time advanced in early Mars history. So that uh, that's kind of sets the, the context for why we chose this uh, particular landing site. Uh, now I'll just kind of zoom in a little bit and show you uh, where we are today. Yeah, here's Gale Crater again, a really gorgeous picture. Uh, showing uh, the mound here again, the central peak, the 100-mile crater, a lot of dark sand that's collected. This is probably modern sand that's blowing around today. Uh, and you see this little strip of dark sand. Those are those dunes that Jim mentioned. And here's where we chose to do our uh, field area. This is where we sent the rover. This is where we planned to explore. And that map that Jim showed all fits in this little box right here. So here's that dark strip of dunes that goes across. We landed out here on the plains there, drove across the plains, started climbing the mountain. This took about two years to get to this point after spending a lot of time at Yellowknife Bay where we made some of our most important initial discoveries. Reached the mountain here and have spent about two years climbing to where we are today at this star. Uh, and uh, we're just about to ascend what's called the Vera Rubin Ridge, a big ridge that forms one of these major layers on the mountain. And then we'll get to a clay unit and a sulfate unit. But most of the past uh, two or three years we've spent on the mountain itself has been in this initial layer of the mountain called the Murray Formation. It doesn't have a fancy name like clay and sulfate or hematite because we didn't know what it was made out of when we landed there. So we just named it after Bruce Murray, one of the founding uh, planetary scientists at, at Caltech. Uh, and so we've been uh, spending all of our time here so far and we're about to get to the next layer. But now, keep your eye on that map, we're now just about to ascend the ridge and this box here is this image from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Yeah, and there, look at that. That's Curiosity right there. Six feet across, and it's, it, you're looking down on Mars from 200 miles above the surface. So this is like looking at a car on the freeway in San Diego from Los Angeles. Uh, so we, you know, we love the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter not only for telling us about Gale before we landed, but for sending our data back every day. But it also continues to watch over us and, uh, and make sure we're, uh, we're still there. <laughs> So um, I couldn't resist throwing in a couple of pictures of what we've been doing lately, and then I'm going to launch into that big story about Mars habitability and climate. So here's some sand dunes. This is, this is the, uh, when we were actually crossing those big sand dunes that uh, Jim mentioned we saw on that map. Uh, what I love about this is not only because it's a, a, a selfie, uh, which our camera team learned how to take. They, they realized that you know a, a camera on the end of your arm isn't good just for looking at the um, microscopic details of the rocks and soils like it was designed to do, you can also raise it up and look at yourself. <laughs> Thank all the millennials for that tip. Um, but it actually takes about 55 images uh, and 55 positions of our arm because the camera isn't designed to be a, a selfie camera. It's designed to be very narrow angle. Uh, so this was a lot of work actually by all the people who did this, but you get these spectacular pictures. And then you Photoshop out the arm and it goes away. Uh, but um, what's, what, what's amazing about this dune, to me, I, I mean, one of the things that um, 
I, I just keep coming back to with this mission, and Mars, in, in fact, is just how Earth-like the planet is. You, especially when you bring really good cameras to Mars like this, uh, you, you have to keep telling yourself, like, this wasn't taken in the desert, you know, out of uh, Barstow or somewhere. Uh, and one of the ways I can try to prove that to you, <laughs> actually, it's not a conspiracy, uh, is, <laughs> is, is that this uh, dune, what I love about it, is it's so Earth-like in one sense. The wind is blowing just like it is on Earth. The wind is picking up debris in the, in the sand and, and making that move around just like sand does on Earth. And sand piles up in dunes just like on Earth. And ripples form on the sand just like on Earth. But one thing you will never be able to see on Earth that's in this picture are these wavy ripples. They only form, that wavelength of ripple and that shape only forms in the thin atmosphere of Mars. So no Earth dune has these little S-shaped ripples that are about three feet apart. Uh, and that is because Mars has this 1% thick atmosphere and different physics applies. Uh, still similar physics enough to form dunes, but different enough to form different ripples. So on this picture, you kind of see Earth and Mars, which I, I really love. The Vera Rubin Ridge, we're about to ascend. This is an eight-story wall of rock that uh, we knew we had to cross to get higher up on the mountain. And we're currently driving along the base of it, um, taking all these wonderful pictures, and then looking for the place where we can climb up. We actually, it's not, a, not too risky because another thing that the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and other orbiters allow us to do is actually map the planet before we get there and make sure there is a, a route we can climb up. So we have a good idea that there's a, a place that's just not too, uh, too steep so we can make it up this eight-story wall of rock and continue on up the mountain. But we're not there yet, so we're on the wall part right now, not the, not the less steep part, and seeing what this, mount, uh, what this ridge is made out of. And again, the, you know, we're, the questions we're asking uh, start with geology in most cases. You know, what is the, why is the ridge there? Uh, it's been flat for so long, and why are, well, all of a sudden is there an eight-story uh, wall of rock? So something about the chemistry that may have changed. Uh, this ridge is called the Vera Rubin Ridge after a pioneering astronomer that inspired a lot of our team members, uh, but uh, it's actually um, also called the hematite unit or the hematite ridge because the ridge has this mineral hematite, an iron oxide, iron that has, um, uh, that's combined with oxygen, been oxygenated uh, or oxidized and forms this mineral, this reddish mineral hematite. So that's a clue. Uh, so maybe uh, there's some process that brought iron in from somewhere else. The iron was dissolved in water and hit the atmosphere at this location of the ridge and got oxidized by oxygen in the atmosphere. That's maybe a theory. There's a lot of other ways this could have happened. We're trying to figure out why the ridge is there, why the hematite's concentrated there, and of course what that means for the habitability of ancient Mars. Here's another gorgeous view of the hematite ridge just from a couple weeks ago and Mount Sharp in the background. And we're now seeing that, that this ridge itself is composed of extremely fine layers uh, and it was once buried and when it was buried it broke into all these chunks and then groundwater um, as it was buried flowed through uh, those fractures and precipitated these whitish minerals which are almost like hard water deposits. They're dissolved minerals in the water that then fill up the cracks. Uh, and so this ridge just has a lot to explore and that's what we'll be doing the next three or four months. But uh, let's get to the main event. That's sort of where we've been doing. I didn't want to start with like a bunch of slides that didn't include some nice pictures at first. Uh, so um, now we're going to launch into a story about the climate and habitability of Mars that'll last the rest of the talk. Uh, so here's Earth and Mars. We love how beautiful our planet is, but Mars is not too bad itself. Uh, it's about this relative size compared to Earth, um, much farther away, of course, than shown here. Uh, it has polar caps. So, um, you know, sometimes it's portrayed like, does Mars have water? We've known it's had ice for decades, you know, since the 1970s, 60s even. So Mars has a ton of water, it's just all frozen now. And the atmosphere is very thin, so it's actually too thin to have liquid water. It would all actually boil or freeze almost at the same time uh, in the very thin atmosphere of Mars. But it does have clouds, these little wispy watery, uh, water ice clouds. Uh, and so. Today, Mars isn't really a very appealing place for life. We've sort of uh, accepted that, even though we'd love to find if there's any, any life on Mars. And today, unfortunately, also extends back about three billion years. We think Mars had the same dry and, um, and cold conditions. Uh, it's a little further out 
from the sun than Earth, so it's quite cold, uh, for probably you know, the last two or three billion years. Uh, but maybe Mars, we think, actually, was quite different early in its history from the time it formed, maybe after it initially cooled off, uh, until maybe a billion years after it formed. Uh, and we have evidence uh, to cause us to think it was quite different. So keep your eye on Mars right now. This is pretty cool. Maybe it was like that. So <laughs> um, it, this is probably the best case scenario. I'll admit that. As a scientist, I have to be honest with you. Uh, so uh, this is like Mars with a giant northern ocean and a huge water cycle with hurricanes. You know, I mean, this is probably the ultimate early Mars. It may have also been some uh, less exciting version of this, but still di very different, where there was rivers and there's lakes. And that's what I'll show you we found, in fact, at Gale Crater. Uh, and so uh, here's some of that evidence for why we are, you know, long before Curiosity got there, we think that Mars did, in fact, have um, a lot more water in the distant past. This is one of the early pictures of Mars from probably the 1970s, uh, where um, in the 60s, uh, uh, let me start there, JPL, just a few years, like a half a decade after Sputnik, JPL already had uh, a mission flying by Mars taking the first pictures. And at that point in 1965, I think it was, Mariner 4, um, there was, you know, you're coming off of a hundreds of years of history where there's sort of just ignorance about Mars, you know? So there was thought that there still could be life on Mars, intelligent life, you know, plants, whatever. 1965, all that excitement with a, with a spacecraft flying by. And um, the first pictures were fuzzy pictures that just had craters. And it really took uh, a lot of, um, it disappointed a lot of people, uh, from what I hear. I wasn't even born yet. But, <laughs> but, uh, but it had a lot of craters that looked like the moon. Like, oh my gosh, Mars is totally dead. Uh, but then just a few years later, pictures like this started coming back from the follow-up missions. Um, so, and, and these are craters that made people think that maybe it was like the moon. But look, in, in between the craters on the plains, there's river systems. You know, th this is hard to get around. That water flowed around the surface and you know, flowed downhill and streams joined each other just like they do on Earth and made bigger rivers and they flowed for sometimes hundreds of miles across the surface of Mars. Uh, a little later in the history, somewhat younger features get even more dramatic. So these are actually channels, catastrophic flood channels. So these, these, these channels here are maybe um, several hundred feet across, you know, quarter mile, third of a mile wide. These channels can be 50 miles wide, 100 miles wide, giant swaths of Mars where just huge amounts of water float across the surface, probably in catastrophic flows, not over and over again, but just a huge flood. But there's a lot of these. And so something dramatic happened at that point in Mars history. And then we started seeing pictures like this when we sent even more sophisticated orbiters. Uh, and this was discovered by the Mars Global Surveyor in about uh, the year 2000, I think, um, where uh, at the end of some of these river networks, that we call them valley networks, uh, they empty into craters like this. And where they empty, they spread out into a fan. This, the, the sediment that's left behind spreads out into a fan. And people you know, found these, and uh, after studying them and trying to disprove their hypotheses about these, they're left with the idea that these are deltas. Uh, so a river flowed into a crater, brought in a lot of silty, muddy water, met a standing body of water. That's the way you form a delta, like the Mississippi going into the, into the Gulf. Uh, and the sediment uh, causes, I mean, the water causes the river to suddenly slow down, and sediment drops out, and it kind of spreads out, and you form this big mound that's a delta with all these different branches that the, the river takes as it enters the standing body of water. So this was evidence that not only were there rivers, but they, were, they lasted a long time to build up a giant feature like this, and there were standing bodies of water in these craters. So here's sort of the history of the climate of Mars. How did we get from here to here? Um, we started four and a half billion years ago, and that geological era, because of all these great features that looked like they were caused by water, uh, we call that the Noachian, like Noah, uh, and that's where the valley networks are. So this is like you know Jurassic Park, those ages on Earth. We have ages on Mars, too. Uh, not the Jurassic, but the Noachian, Hesperian, and Amazonian. And the Noachian is where you see the valley networks, all those rivers. The Amazonian is the three billion years to the present, where it's just 
wind and ice really formed everything, not much liquid water anymore. Uh, and then the Hesperian is kind of this mysterious time in Mars history where uh, there's not as much evidence for long-lived rivers, but it's not quite dry yet, and you have these catastrophic floods that, how do they, what have, you know, what's the deal with those? Uh, and so uh, this is actually a quite interesting time to explore. Uh, and in terms of climate, when you figure out, when you ask yourself, you know, how, what was necessary for the climate system of Mars to be able to, to form those features and to have uh, a hydrologic cycle, for example, that could supply rivers and, and lakes, uh, we've concluded pretty much as a, as a scientific community that, that well, Mars was wet. Hopefully you're convinced of that. It's hard to deny all that real uh, geologic evidence. And maybe even warm. You could have had ice that occasionally melted and formed these rivers and lakes. But a much easier way to do that is you find some way to heat up Mars uh, with a thicker atmosphere maybe. Uh, and then it's warm enough to actually have a hydrologic cycle with a humid atmosphere and evaporation from one place and rain in another place, and then you really get a, a very Earth-like early Mars. There's problems with this, actually, uh, which make it all the more fun to think about. Um, and the same problem actually is true for Earth, in fact. We, uh, when you look at stars across the universe, you kind of come up with a life cycle of stars, and they start glowing less brightly then, uh, then, and then, and as they get a little older, and they get into their, I don't know, their teenage years, <laughs> they get very strong and, and bright. And there's a thing called the faint young sun paradox, where you have um, a lot of water on Earth when the sun shouldn't have been bright enough to allow it to be liquid. And the Mars is even wor the, the problem is even worse at Mars, where the same faint young sun existed for a billion years ago. Only about 75% of the energy that comes off the sun today uh, was present in early Mars. And, and we, frankly, don't have any climate models that take that sun and predict a warm and wet Mars. So um, this makes it really fun for us on the Curiosity mission to find a lot of evidence, which I'll show you, that says it was probably warm and wet, and yet the uh, people who run climate models have no idea how to make that work. So um, uh, see if you believe it. <laughs> uh, so what's cool about it is that Gale Crater is right in the Hesperian. So the crater didn't even form until about 3.8 billion years ago. So we know that everything Curiosity is seeing is from the Hesperian onward. And we think that entire mountain formed and lasted a few hundred billion years. And so, um, it's 100 billion, geez, um, 100 million years. Uh, so, um, so from 3.8 to maybe 3.2 billion years ago is all the stuff you'll see in our pictures other than the sand that's blowing around today. But all the rock, all the mountain parts are formed in this uh, time period. So we get to explore this really interesting time and ask, was, you know, right here at the beginning, was Mars wet and warm? We can, talk, we can sort of infer what might have been the conditions here. And then we can ask, how long did those conditions last? And what does it mean for the possibility of life? I think that was my next slide. So um, this is sort of where we are with the Curiosity mission when, it's, when we started. Mars was once wet. And we want to know, was it also warm? And uh, the specific question, of course, that NASA charged us to answer is, was it habitable? And uh, if, if, the, you know, if there was ice and it melted for a day, that's not really that interesting for life and habitability because uh, you know, life can't evolve in 24 hours. So, but if we can find that these wet conditions lasted for millions of years, you know, tens of millions of years, hopefully longer, uh, that gives life a real chance to do what it did on Earth. So habitability. This is not Mars. <laughs> this is one of the, for us, less habitable places. You like spending time in Death Valley. Uh, but um, perfectly habitable. <clears throat> And so you have, um, well, this, you know, when I give talks and there's like, you know, eight-year-olds, I make them answer, what, what, are, what is habitability? What conditions are required? But I will make you answer. So liquid water is the first one. Uh, so, you know, when we think of what are the essential characteristics of an environment that life can um, exist in, uh, liquid water is always the top of the list. Every life form we know on Earth requires liquid water. And it actually requires not only liquid water, but um, liquid water that's the kind of right, the right liquid water, um, not too acidic, you know, not too, uh, not too much dissolved in it. Um, you know, if it's too salty, things don't live. 
uh, that sort of thing. So um, we need to be a little more sophisticated than just finding evidence for liquid water. We need to ask, what's the water like? The key chemical ingredients for life, uh, at least by analogy with Earth, we're not talking about science fiction here. Our best way of looking for life on Mars is by analogy with us on Earth. And living things on Earth share a lot of common characteristics in terms of the chemistry. So carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur, phosphorus, uh, nitrogen. There's like five or six elements plus a few others that are common denominators for all of us and bacteria and everything else. So let's see if Mars had those to provide as raw material for life. And then energy for metabolism. We all need sources of energy. You know, we eat things, who eat other things, and eventually use the sun or, you know, something like that. There's a food chain we're on the top of. On Mars, probably no food chain. Probably if life ever existed, it was probably just really basic life. And so it could use sunlight. Uh, but one of the interesting things um, that we can look for on Mars also is the way that certain microbes on Earth can use uh, chemistry uh, for energy. So you can dig down or you can somehow get, you know, a mile below the surface of Earth and find living microbes. And they, uh, some of them are actually able to use the chemical differences between rocks uh, at that depth. There are minerals in the rocks and create little, you know, batteries that, um, you know, be between different chemicals and allow them to, uh, to, to source that energy to live. So we can look for those similar types of sources of energy on Mars uh, if, if life may have been uh, underground. And then how do we look for all this? How do we study habitability? Jim did a great job of describing the rover. We love the laser. It's the most fun experiment uh, to run. Uh, but the, <laughs> the way we really... Um, uh, the way that we get at the habitability issues and the chemical ingredients necessary for life and the raw material and all those things uh, in the most in-depth way is through our drill, which we place against a rock and drill powder and deliver it to two laboratories that are built in the front of the rover. So this was a real feat for um, the, the people who designed and built the rover to actually fit in laboratories. Uh, these are laboratories that would fill a, a better part of a university office, you know, in a, in a geology department in a university. This is a mass spectrometer uh, and a gas chromatograph and a tunable laser spectrometer. Probably spread it out over like a huge room in a university, but you shrink it down, you miniaturize it, you stuff it all in a, a, a canister about the size of an old microwave oven, and you gold plate it because it's cool. <laughs> and then... <laughs> And then you carefully put it in the rover. And so this is one of our main laboratories called SAM, Sample Analysis at Mars. Everything's an acronym. Um, and 650 yards of wiring, ovens that heat up the rock and soil to 1,000 degrees and decompose it, you know, degrade it so that the gases come off and we can study them. And uh, some of our most nerve-wracking mechanisms on the rover, 100,000 RPM vacuum pumps which, you know, you can never maintain. You send them to Mars and you hope they keep working. This is the kind of thing, you'd, you know, people would, uh, yeah. We get nervous about sending any motors to Mars, even simple motors, but 100,000 RPM <laughs> pumps, they're still working. Uh, so here, we landed. Uh, so five years ago, um, at actually 10.30 tonight is uh, when we all uh, gathered here at JPL with about, I think, a thousand other people to, uh, to listen helplessly, actually, as Mars sent back, Curiosity sent back signals 14 minutes old uh, as it descended to the surface. Um, I'd show you the movie, it's super fun, but um, go watch it online if you want to relive it. Uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, these are the, the, the scour marks from the rocket engines that were on a little um, Jetpack that lowered the rover to the surface, and they actually led to one of our first major discoveries about climate and habitability. Uh, this is Mount Sharp. Those are those dunes. So you know we landed quite far away, and since then have like traversed across those dunes and climbed uh, a little ways up the mountain. But here are those scour marks, and we looked up close uh, just you know days after landing, about a month after landing, we got to this site where we found these what looked like upturned pieces of sidewalk. Uh, and uh, it turned out that they were a rock called a conglomerate. Uh, that's a rock made out of a bunch of other rock that's cemented together, just like a sidewalk, actually. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as the rock was, um, uh, was falling apart after a few billion years of sitting there, uh, 
the pebbles that were coming out were all distinctly rounded. You can see that, you know, and, and that is something that doesn't happen um, uh, too easily, you know, in, in the natural world. When rocks break, they are very sharp and jagged. But if they're, you know, rolling around uh, in a stream, for example, for 10 miles or so, you can round them like you've seen here. And so we already had this really, you know, visceral evidence that we were traversing across an ancient stream bed just a month after landing. And, and we thought that might be the case from outlines of an ancient river that we could see near, near our landing site. Uh, but this is really the first time that, that we've been on the surface of Mars and with our own, you know, robotic eyes seen um, uh, something that we can all relate to, you know, uh, rounded pebbles in the bottom of a stream bed. We then drove over to Yellowknife Bay. Uh, and so here's, a, um, here's Mount Sharp. Uh, this is one of our gorgeous images from our navigation cameras, which are uh, grayscale black and white cameras. This is our arm deployed at the surface. <clears throat> We're about to drill here. And uh, what uh, you'll notice how dramatic the scenery has changed. We, but in the in the image you saw before, there's a bunch of gravel, little rocks everywhere. Now we're now we're in these big slabs of rock. Uh, and what attracted us to this site is again from looking at the orbital pictures, thinking that that stream might have led to an ancient lake at one point. And uh, and when we got here at the site of this, um, what we thought might have been an ancient lake the rocks all of a sudden turn into these big slabs, a very fine-grained material. Uh, and, and so far, that was really good news for the fact that it could actually be uh, lake deposits. And so, of course, we wanted to drill it. Uh, I love these pictures of our drill holes. Um, the, the drill hole is only a dime size, so uh, to kind of give you a sense of the scale. And we have, um, this is one of my favorite pictures of the whole mission, <laughs> just because of how cool it is. But we, <laughs> we drilled this hole, and we took a picture of it from about seven feet off the ground, looking at a dime-sized drill hole, so we have great cameras. And then we shot it with the laser, uh, again, from seven feet off the ground into a dime-sized drill hole uh, to see if the composition changed with the drill, uh, with the depth of the drill. And then we saw this gorgeous um, uh, mineral vein, which is, again, that sort of hard water deposit stuff, calcium sulfate, which probably was groundwater flowing through the rock after it hardened. Uh, this is also really one of my favorite pictures. Uh, you get to see like my favorite pictures of Mars tonight in the <laughs> five-year anniversary talk. Um, what I love about this one is that uh, we took it with our own lights in the middle of the night. Uh, and so when, all the other pictures of Mars you'll see uh, are, are sort of uh, falsely, or you know, as best as we can do, corrected to remove the orange glow of all the dust in Mars' atmosphere. So if you just snap a picture on Mars, it's very orange. But we try to color correct them so that human eyes can sort of better understand what's going on with all the orange. But this one is a real picture because the, the glow of the orange sky is gone at night. And when you bring a LED, a, a little, your own flash with you on the camera, uh, you get a, a, this is the real color of Mars. <laughs> um, and so what was cool is that we drilled into the rock and the material inside the rock wasn't red, uh, which is true of most of the oxidized parts of Mars. Uh, it was actually gray, and so that was great evidence that this material uh, hadn't been exposed to a lot of harsh conditions like other parts of Mars that had been oxidized and weathered and uh, may actually, you know, um, preserve evidence of the conditions from a long time ago. So again, fine-grained material, and then we analyzed it in our laboratories, and we found uh, an ancient lake um, based on the geology. We found fresh water. Uh, based on the minerals that were in that drill hole. Uh, we found clay minerals in particular, phyllosilicates, that form when water interacts with rock, but not just any water, water that's not too acidic. Uh, we found not too many salts dissolved in that rock, uh, so the water was basically fresh water available for life. And we found the key chemical ingredients of life. We found carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and sulfur and phosphorus and nitrogen in the form of nitrates. That's actually a nutrient for life, a form of nitrogen that life can use. And we found organic molecules. We found simple organic molecules, not like DNA quite yet, um, but we found organic molecules that at least showed that Mars um, had already begun to naturally probably assemble larger molecules out of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, and those molecules, very importantly, survived three billion years sitting in these rocks. So uh, in future missions, when we go look for life or return samples back from Earth, this is one of our main findings from the mission, is that we have hope that 
even old rocks have preserved that evidence that we can bring back and study uh, on Earth. Okay, so um, I'm, I got to keep this from going into the three hour version of the talk. <laughs> so I'm going to speed up. But this is a little map of Mars, uh, of the mission really, in sort of profile. We landed out here on Yellowknife Bay. We drove across the plains. Uh, and um, that's sort of where we spent the first two years. So I got just a couple pictures of what we found there. Another one of my favorite pictures. This is, uh, we came across this amazing landscape where uh, the, the, the fine grain, muddy uh, mudstone, we call it, the lake bed deposits, uh, had um, gone away and the gravel had gone away, and there was this amazing set of these linear beds of sandstone. So now not, now not mud, but bigger particles of sand that had, um, that had formed slabs, and you can see all the slabs are kind of tilted away from you towards Mount Sharp. And this was, again, you know, studied. We tried to come up with a lot of ways of explaining this, and as good scientists tried to prove ourselves wrong in each case, and the, the theory that, the hypothesis that survived was that this was a river delta. Uh, and so we now had seen uh, a river bed, a stream bed. We had seen a, a, the lake bed of a, of a, of a lake uh, in, in Yellowknife Bay. And then now we find the interface between those two. Where a river meets a lake, uh, it forms a delta. So, and it forms the delta out of sand. That's the, that's the particular size of particles that first gets dumped out of the water when a flowing river hits a lake. Uh, and so um, this made it kind of an amazing prediction, though. It, it suggested that there was a giant lake that probably filled in much of the area in this picture. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, um, what's not obvious from this picture, but everything sort of goes higher and higher. So there's a lake uh, a delta here and then all this rock above it. So that doesn't quite work. How do, you, how do you have a lake in front of you when the mountain is climbing up in front of you? Unless the mountain wasn't there when the lakes were there, and instead the mountain itself is some remnant of lake beds that were built successful, successively over time. So that was sort of a, a, a crazy hypothesis, but we had to go test it, of course. As we got to the mountain, the prediction was we would find lake bed sediments like at Yellowknife Bay, but in the mountain itself. And that's what we found, remarkably. We got to the base of the mountain, and we found these very thin, repetitive layers, two millimeters, three millimeters thick, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. You can form those by wind, uh, for example, blowing around sand or blowing around dust. But when you do that, you tend to form more wavy uh, beds that, that uh, you follow one layer and it kind of ends and then another one starts, it's called cross bedding. Uh, these, you can follow these layers for a long ways across the entire um, surface. And it's very consistent with very slow sedimentation inside a standing body of water where it's calm water, the lake floor just goes on forever, and you just, just deposit a very thin layer year after year, decade after decade, and you build up you know, years and years and decades and eons of time in, uh, in these uh, deposits. So we, felt, we found this at the base of the mountain, and then of course we wanted to figure out how much of the mountain, how, how long does this story go on how, you know, how long did the lakes last? So that's what we did. We got to the mountain here, and then we were in the Murray Formation, this, this main uh, first layer of the mountain that we're, we've been in for the entire time up until about a month from now when we actually climbed the hematite unit. Um, and we first had to drive across some obstacles. Uh, one of them was called the Stimson Formation, which is another geologic term we use for a bunch of sandstone that probably came in, we think, later and it just is sort of a, a younger thing we have to sort of drive around to continue to find more lake bed deposits. Here's what it looked like as we were driving across towards the higher parts of the mountain. This is one of, my, well, I'll say it again, one of my favorite pictures. <laughs> and the reason it is, uh, in this case, is because it shows such great variety of all the materials that, um, that we, uh, we study. There's the gravel, there are these dark rocks that we actually, is one of the more mysterious things, we don't really understand these very dark rocks. They're, they're kind of rare, but here there's a bunch of them. There's the sand that we've studied many times. There's the mudstone, the lake bed deposits that look like this. There's sandstone that came later, the Stimson Formation, that's on the, that forms these mesas and buttes. 
Uh, and then there's the rounded domes here of the sulfate unit that's higher up on the mountain that we maybe get to in a, a year or two. Uh, and then the upper parts of Mount Sharp. Uh, and here's what it looks like when we're um, at the interface between the mud of the lakes and the sand of the Stimson Formation. And we got a really good look at the, at the Stimson here, which is the sandstone that came later. And actually, this is the site where we learned, where we put pieced together the history of did it actually come later. And we did that at, at what's called a geological contact, kind of a, a word that probably makes immediate sense to you, where two things touch, the contact. And that's one thing where you can learn about what, uh, how one um, episode of forming rocks turned into another by looking at their interface. You know? So we spent a lot of time in this area called Marias Pass studying the details of this interface and figuring out that the mudstone formed, eroded away, then sand blew in by the wind. This wasn't formed in water at all. And, and sand dunes built up. And then those dunes turned into rock and left these amazing sandstone formations behind. And if you think those are pretty, look at these. Uh, these are just amazing uh, landscape, like you're in you know, Utah or Arizona or somewhere. Uh, these are the Murray Buttes, and here's all the lake bed mudstone that we continue to see over and over again as we climb the mountain. And then the later sandstone came in. You can imagine that all these was, were once connected. There was a whole thick layer of sand that blew in uh, and then was buried and turned into rock. And now most of it, you know, 90% of it has been eroded away and blown away. Uh, and you just leave these impressive towers behind. And the, the tower is sort of protected by this, uh, this capping rock that protects it from erosion and slowly blocks fall off. And if you come, you know, um, 10,000 years from now, it'll be a little smaller. And a million years from now, it might be gone. Uh, so then we really got to the good stuff um, when we uh, passed through the Stimson Formation and we got to where the mountain just starts taking off in elevation. Uh, and so we've been climbing now for uh, the past few years uh, through the bulk of the Murray Formation, almost 600 feet. Uh, and this offered the opportunity for us to, um, uh, to kind of change our approach. The variety sort of went away. There was not the, the buttes anymore and the sandstone. It was just all mudstone. And so we came up with an, a process of every once in a while just drilling regularly. Every 25 meters, we said, we're going to drill a hole and build up a record of how the Murray Formation changed over time. Because if it was all lakes, you know, maybe the lakes changed over time. Maybe they came and went. Maybe they, their chemistry changed and their habitability conditions changed. So let's just build up a record. And that's what this shows. We've now drilled uh, 15 times on Mars. And we've scooped up sand and analyzed in our laboratories four times. And these are all the drill holes that we drilled on the, on, in the Murray Formation. And you can see there's a lot of variety. Even to your eye, you know, some of it is the less weathered oxidized material that's grayer. Others, it's distinctly red, like, uh, like most of Mars appears, because it's more oxidized. And so by drilling successively as we climb through the Murray every 25 meters, we could see that the environmental conditions were actually changing. And uh, we, of course, um, uh, wanted to understand what that meant for the prospects for life and habitability. So, you know, I won't go through all this, but this is sort of one of the ways that we visualize the data as a, as a science team. These pie charts represent the different minerals that are in the rocks. Uh, and so out here on Yellowknife Bay, there's a lot of green. Those are the clay minerals, the ones that really are the definitive evidence for water interacting with rock in a lake and fresh water and, and, and less acidic water. Then we got to the base of Mount Sharp, and we still had clays. We still had the lake bed deposits. Uh, but we started seeing a bunch of this red pie slice, which is hematite, which is this iron oxide. Uh, and so the conditions that were very, uh, you know, unoxidized, not too uh, harshly weathering back at Yellowknife Bay seemed to have gotten a little um, harsher, so to speak, more weathering, more oxidation, uh, even though the clays were still there and the lake was still there. And as we got even higher, even the hematite went away, and even some of the basic rock forming minerals went away. And, and this drill hole itself was just left with one of, the, uh, one of the basic parts of a rock, which is silica, and not too much else. And so uh, what was beautiful about this is we had some patterns that we could try to explain, uh, interpret by, by environmental conditions changing over time. 
because each one of these drill holes is higher than the next by 25 meters. Uh, and, and I'll focus on how we have two explanations. It's a nice, uh, friendly competition in the science team. We have a lot of data, and we have two different models to explain it. Uh, and then as we got even higher, uh, we saw this very different looking combination of minerals. And then we saw three drill holes that were almost identical to each other and suggested that conditions actually weren't too, changing too much in that part of the mountain. So uh, briefly, one idea that explains the, uh, the clays and the uh, hematite down here at the base of this 30-foot section of rock where we drilled three times. Now, these are a little tighter space than 25 meters. We drilled three times in a row right here. Um, is that uh, the lakes were there, they deposited sediment, and then groundwater later on flowed through these rocks, and it was slightly acidic. And it, it actually took some of the, it dissolved, you know, with, with acid, some of the parts of the rock and minerals, and delivered them down to these areas. So we see more hematite, we see more trace metals down here, and we see the, a lot of these are just depleted of a lot of their uh, initial minerals and chemicals. So that was one model. Another model that does a pretty good job also of explaining the same data, so uh, it's, it's fun to have these competing ideas, is that there was a lake, or a series of lakes really on Mars, that had different amounts of oxygen dissolved in it. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know this on Earth, but maybe some of you are, are, are fisher people, um, and there are, there's more oxygen near the, the shore of a lake, and when you get deeper water, there's less oxygen, and so a lot of stuff lives in the more oxygenated part of the upper surface of the lake where it, where it mixes with the atmosphere. And the same thing would be expected on Mars if the lakes were, were kind of placid and, and not overturning too much. You'd get more oxygen in the near, part of, near shore part of the lake and deeper down, less oxygen, uh, less oxidant, you know, of, of either caused by ultraviolet light or oxygen directly mixing in from the atmosphere. And so you might find that if we drilled in a rock that was once part of a nearshore environment, you'd have more hematite and you'd have more of those um, oxygen-enhanced uh, um, minerals. And if you drill a hole that once was in the deep part of a lake, you might see that change to the other uh, classes of minerals that we found in the other holes. So this does a pretty good job of explaining the mineralogy, the chemistry, uh, and, and fits in the lake hypothesis too. So, uh, now it's just left to, you know, really uh, gather more data and think through and really see which one of these uh, ends up winning the day. So to finish up our exploration of the Murray, a couple more interesting things. This was a really cool find for us, a, um, a picture of, of mud cracks on ancient Mars. This is a slab of rock about two feet across, and it really was striking. We hadn't seen anything that looked like this when we came across it, where you have these little rectangular patterns all over this rock just maybe an inch across each, uh, and very you know angular patterns. And it, it really struck a lot of the geologists on our team uh, immediately as uh, desiccation cracks, cracks that form like on, in a drying pond on, in the middle of summer on Earth. The, the water goes away, the mud's left behind, and you get these, you've, we've probably all seen it, these little square blocks of mud. Uh, and this was what it would look like if the layer above this rock layer had all those cracks, uh, and, and sort of left their imprint, and because you see these as ridges. So it's almost like a plaster of Paris imprint of mud cracks. Uh, and they were confined to this thin red layer. We measured the angles and the geometries of all these cracks and compared them to mud cracks on Earth, and it turned out, again, that this was the best scientific explanation for this rock. And, uh, you know, all that's very academic, but then, you know, I think about this, and it's just amazing, because to me, it's not a dinosaur. Uh, we'd love to find a dinosaur. But if you're, a, if, you're, if you're a geologist, this is, you know, getting close to finding, like, the dinosaur footprint, where we're looking at, like, you know, a day or a week on ancient Mars. You know, you're looking at there was a lake, and one day the lake dried up, and the mud cracked, and then we're looking at it three billion years later. You know, it, it's just kind of, like, uh, mind-blowing in a way. And, uh, and so this was evidence now that the lakes didn't last forever. In fact, the higher we got on the, on the mountain, we started seeing more things like this, where the lakes actually disappeared every now and then. Uh, so um, that's interesting. So we're beginning to see maybe a, a twist in the plot of the history of, of Mount Sharp and Gale Crater. Uh, and, and, and yet, 
After this, we've seen more of those continuous thin layers again. So the lakes came back. But we think now for the past maybe third of the 600 feet of Mount Sharp we've uh, explored, that the upper third is a lot more intermittent than the bottom two thirds. Uh, but if your hopes for ancient life are waning, I will cheer you up again. Uh, because after all those lakes went away, even the ones that came and went, all this stuff was buried and turned into rock and fractured. And the fractures are just everywhere we look, they're filled with this calcium sulfate. So that means even after the lakes dried up at the surface, there was still groundwater flowing through the ground and bringing chemicals from one place to another, you know, dissolving calcium and sulfate from one place, filling cracks and leaving these little fins of, of calcium sulfate for us to find today. So uh, the history of water in Gale Crater isn't just confined to the lakes, but also as long as the groundwater lasted after the environment at the surface may have been too dry. So in the future, we're going to keep climbing. Uh, we still got a lot to do. We are now at the, at the hematite ridge, which is this wall. So we're actually down here now with the rover. We're going to ascend the wall, go over it, get into the, um, the, uh, a big unit of clay that's still further up. So the amazing thing is all the clay we found so far wasn't visible from space, uh, from, the, from the instruments on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that can detect clays from space. Uh, we don't know why exactly that is, but we discovered them because we were there and were able to drill. But the clays here are a bright signal up to space that, you know, there's clays in these rocks. So we've been waiting to get to this clay area uh, since before landing, you know, since we picked this site. So it's going to be very exciting for us to get there and see uh, what it means for another possible lake environment. So to wrap up here, here we are with the story of climate and habitability on Mars. You know, Mars was once wet. Uh, was it warm? I think it's quite likely. And the reason we think that is, in spite of the faint young sun paradox, uh, is that um, uh, the lakes were there for so long and they were so continuous that it's very hard to explain them by the other creative ideas that scientists have had of how you can get the, the rivers and, and uh, floods in a permanently cold environment. You have to have like a volcano goes off and makes gases in the atmosphere that um, temporarily create a warm planet for a hundred years or a thousand years, or you have a meteorite hit and also create uh, a temporary atmosphere, um, or you have seasonal ice that occasionally you know, trickles out a little bit of water. None of those really can, can support the amount of water uh, we see that would be required to build up all these layers, which are you know, uh, 30 miles of, of, you know, of lake sediments that build up hundreds and hundreds of feet thick. So you have to have a lot of flowing water to deliver that sand, to deliver that sediment. And then if you just take um, kind of rough calculations of how long it would take to build up 600 feet of lake bed deposits based on an analogy with Earth, it's probably millions to tens of millions of years. Uh, so, you know, that's not a lot of time in the billion year sense, but it's a lot of time uh, to, um, to explain unless you had uh, a humid atmosphere that was stable, like a stable, warm, early climate of Mars. And so um, I think the, the legacy of, of the mission is going to, you know, one of the legacies besides the main one, which of habitability, is going to be that we threw a wrench into our understanding of the climate of Mars by showing that in the Hesperian, it remained warm and, and wet, uh, and you know, quite likely had a, a Mars had a pretty good hydrologic system. I just said that. <laughs> and so, um, what's next then? Um, you know, uh, Curiosity's doing great. She's getting a little older. Things are starting to break a little bit, but we still got a lot ahead of us, and we think we still got, I don't know, three, four, or five years of great science ahead at the, at the clay unit, the hematite ridge, the sulfates beyond, and we'll complete, you know, the story of the, of the climate in the Hesperian. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've, based on the chemistry of all that water uh, and the f fact we found organic molecules, we've also, you know, it's synonymous to us with habitability. So not only did water last millions and tens of millions of years, but habitable conditions, more importantly, lasted that long. 
And that's the kind of time scale that life can really begin to make use of in terms of you know, originating on Mars or being delivered somewhere else and evolving and surviving on Mars, spreading on Mars. So that, uh, you know, and combine that with our third contribution, I think, of this mission, which is finding organic molecules that have been preserved for three billion years, that really sets up this good-looking rover, because it's based on Curiosity. <laughs> this is the Mars 2020 rover, which looks a lot like Curiosity, but will actually be sent to Mars to seek signs of life. And this was planned optimistically, hoping that Curiosity would find that Mars was once habitable and capable of preserving signs of life. And now that you know, we, have, we have shown that that's possible, this mission you know, is, is our best chance for actually determining if life ever took hold, both by the instruments it carries with it to Mars to explore an environment that we think is habitable, and by collecting samples that one day we might be able to return back to Earth and study in the best laboratories on Earth. So um, yeah, that's kind of where we are, and, and uh, thank you very much.